Greetings, lovers of lore. Thank you for joining me for the next installment of the Brothers War Story. At the end of our previous installment, Takasia had realized the brothers were turning their stones against each other. And the story continues as the front door of Urza's cabin slammed open and Takasia and Amal quickly ran inside. The room reeked of char and smoke. The reason for this was readily apparent. Urza and Mishra were facing off against each other, wielding their Thran stones. Massive surges of red and green energy flowed back and forth, almost like a shoving match being held by proxy. This was far more dangerous than a mere shoving match, however, as evidenced by the blood pouring from both brothers' noses. Using the stones was exacting a terrible price. The pain was evident on the boys' faces, yet neither yielded an inch, gripping their stones for dear life. Power was building in the room. It was a tempest of light. Takasia shielded her eyes and tried to get the brothers' attention, but they were too focused on their conflict. So she did what came naturally to her in these situations and stepped between them. Her plan worked as both Mishra and Urza immediately whipped their eyes towards her. Unfortunately, this shattered the brothers' concentration, and the massive power they had brought to bear against each other was now released in a giant chaotic blast. Urza's cabin exploded, smashed to bits that rained down over the crowd gathered outside. Nothing remained of Urza's home. Of the cabin's occupants, the brothers fared best, only somewhat battered. Old Amal fared worse. His knee was shattered. But that was nothing compared to Takasia. Her body lay broken and twisted. Urza drew her lifeless form into his lap, tears flowing freely down his face. This was the first time anyone in camp had ever seen him cry. Mishra knelt beside them, sorrow plain on his face. Urza looked at his brother with such hateful revulsion that Mishra involuntarily leapt back. He opened his mouth to say something, but quickly snapped his jaw shut and fled into the night. Takasia was put to rest the next day. Mishra had not returned, and Urza refused to leave her side. Even after the funeral rites were completed, he remained. And that's where Amal found him still the next morning. He had not moved all night. Amal spoke into the solemn silence. We must send the students in camp back to Penragon. From the look in Urza's eyes, Amal could tell that he had basically forgotten that everyone else existed. We must stay, he said determinedly. With Takasia dead, the Falaji will leave. They would have stayed for Mishra, for he dwelt among them. But you are not well known to them. Urza's face hardened. We will just get other diggers. It is not so simple, young Urza. To continue, you will need soldiers. You are no longer safe. I hear mutterings amongst my people that you killed Takasia and chased Mishra off to hide the truth. Urza was crestfallen. I can't believe they would think that. I miss Mishra too. I have no clue where he went. Amal reached out and placed a fatherly hand on Urza's shoulder, but Urza pulled back and Amal let his hand fall back by his side. Reluctantly, he gave Urza one long last look and walked quietly off. Word of Takasia's death spread quickly, and an evacuation was organized. The nobility back in Penragon were panicking about their children. The ornithopter that had been sent into the city with the bad news about Takasia had returned bearing Lauren, a former student of Takasia's. Urza helped her sort through Takasia's notes, spending a few days in the process, while ornithopters flew in shifts, searching the desert sands for Mishra. Despite their best efforts, he was nowhere to be seen. Urza ultimately decided not to return to Penragon. His so-called mother would not be pleased to hear from him, and he had no other family but Mishra who was currently lost to him. He couldn't bear to watch the camp disintegrate before his eyes, so Urza bid Amal farewell and left with a group of Falaji that Amal had confirmed did not hate him. Amal could see defeat in every movement as they left. Urza had lost everything. He departed with the clothes on his back, a walking stick, and a few cracked power stones. He had lost Takasia, Mishra, 
and now his only home. The caravan Urza traveled with left the sands of the desert behind making its way into the nation of Yosha and ultimately stopping in the capital city of Krug, the city being named after the warlord who ruled it. Urza bade farewell to the Falaji and headed into the city proper to seek employment. He first went to the temple schools, offering to work as a scholar. Unfortunately, Urza was from Argive, and Argive was not a very religious nation. As a result, Urza had never been schooled in matters of religion, so the Yoshin temple priests turned him away. Urza then turned to trying to join a guild, but each time he was turned down. Yoshin guilds wanted to hire Yoshin citizens. It took three long months of searching before Urza finally found a minor member of the Jewelers and Clockmakers Guild who would take him on. And that's how Urza came to work for the grandiose Rusko the Clockmaker, being paid barely more than a roof over his head. They worked together in a cramped little squat building that was cram-packed with clocks along every wall. Rusko was a fat, balding, bespectacled hustler, but he had a special place in his heart for Urza. At first, Rusko was happy to have such a loyal apprentice he could work like a dog. But over time, it troubled Rusko in that Urza was so serious. So when the opportunity to breathe some joy into Urza's life presented itself, Rusko leapt at it. The opportunity came in the form of a princess, one Kayla Bin Krug, daughter of the Warlord Krug. Kayla was renowned for her beauty. Raven-haired, with eyes that were liquid pools of darkness, and dressed in the finest silks. Kayla appeared unexpectedly one day at Rusko's shop. She was in search of a clockmaker. Rusko fumbled over himself, not able to decide between boasting and groveling in reaction to being graced with a royal presence. Most glorious majesty, your Lumesit's presence in my shop is in honor beyond compare. Rusko almost fell over his own fat belly attempting a courtly bow. Kayla favored him with a smile. You are a clockmaker? Rusko beamed proudly. Majesty, you stand in the house of Rusko the clockmaker, ever at your service. Excellent. I am in need of assistance with this. As she said it, she drew out a silvered rectangle from a bag at her hip. Rusko leaned in eagerly to see what she was holding. The box she held was shined to such a brilliance that at first Rusko couldn't even see that it was silver. He accepted the box and gently inspected it, turning it over in his hands, pretending he knew what it was. Ahem, he said, no clue how to proceed. Kayla picked up on his cluelessness. This music box no longer functions. Rusko didn't miss a beat, pretending he'd known this all along. Ah, for something this routine, I call in my apprentice. He will handle it for you. Rusko bellowed towards the back of the shop. Apprentice, you are needed! Kayla started when she saw Urza rise from the back of the workshop. He had been in the room the entire time just working away? This had never happened before. Everyone was always excited to see her wherever she went. How could he ignore a beautiful princess? Urza stopped his work, stood up, and walked briskly over to join Rusko and Kayla. How may I assist you, madam? he inquired. Rusko leapt in. The princess needs her music box fixed. Rusko really leaned into the word princess, trying to impress on Urza just who they were dealing with. Urza took the princess's silver music box in his hands flipped it over, and deftly removed the bottom panel. The metal protested loudly. The box hadn't been opened up like this in many years. And Rusko turned a sickly green, imagining the cost of having to replace the royal music box if Urza had just broken it. The inside of the box was a confounding array of gears. Urza peered inside for a moment, and then slid a thin tool from his pocket and placed the tip of it gently inside the music box. A flick of his wrist, and there was a tiny satisfying snap of a loose gear moving back into proper alignment. Urza looked pleased as he reassembled the box and returned it to the princess. She favored him with one of her best smiles as she opened the music box's lid. 
The smile fell from her face as no music played, and Rusko's face went white. Apprentice, have you broken this fine lady's ancient heirloom? The way that Urza responded to Rusko would make any onlooker think that Urza was the master. The box must be wound. He turned to Kayla. Did you bring your key? Kayla was dumbfounded. This was the first she had ever heard of any key. Urza read the confusion on her face and walked to the back of the workshop. He rummaged around and found an ancient rusty cylinder with old bronze fittings. The thing was pitted and dull, its rough common nature a direct contrast to the filigreed beauty of the music box. Urza inserted the key into the music box and gave it a few turns. Opening the top caused music to spill forth. This music box was well built, so the music carried none of the cheap tinniness of lesser made boxes. Kayla clapped her hands delightedly while Urza held forth both the music box in one hand and the old rusty key in the other. Kayla graciously took the music box from Urza while at the same time Rusko's hand reached out viper quick and snatched the key from Urza's other hand. Rusko presented the key with his version of a courtly flourish. Majesty, I present to you the key of Rusko! Pride beamed from his face. Kayla looked at Urza and spoke. You have my thanks, Rusko. Urza's face twitched, trying to hide his amusement, and he could hear Rusko choking on his own disbelief. Good lady, I am Urza. He is Rusko. And any competent jeweler can make you a better key. Kayla thanked Urza and departed from the clockmaker's shop. Rusko raced to the window to watch her depart. She stood outside the door staring down at the rusty, unremarkable key with a bemused smile on her face before sliding the key into her bag. Rusko did not leave the window until the princess was completely out of view. When he finally walked away, he had a look on his face that Urza recognized as half wonder and half greed. Kayla Ben Krug, the princess was in the house of Rusko. He sauntered over to Urza. Such a beauty, the fairest in all of Krug. Urza shrugged. If you say so, I was just trying to fix the music box. She had an interest in you, my boy. I saw it in her eyes when she looked at you. Urza interjected. Speaking of the key, what was all that about the key of Rusko? Rusko's face split with a big grin. Rule number one. Always stamp your name on every creation. It grows your reputation. A thousand years from now, the people will still remember Rusko. Anyhow, you are trying to distract Rusko. Admit that the princess was a vision. Urza sighed. He knew when Rusko wasn't going to let something go. Very well, she was breathtaking. A rare beauty indeed. But what of it? We shall never meet again. I may as well be about my work. And with that, Urza strode back to his workbench and set to work. Rusko rolled his eyes, but decided to bide his time. A month rolled by before he found his chance. As it turned out, Kayla Bin Krug had been betrothed, but her husband-to-be had been in a shipwreck. The warlord of Krug was furious. He doted on his daughter, and the man who had died in the shipwreck was the only suitable candidate to marry his daughter. To find a new husband for Kayla, the warlord created a test. A towering 20-foot high jade statue in the likeness of the warlord was placed in front of the palace by a team of strong men. The challenge was to move this jade statue the entire length of the courtyard. The warlord wanted only the strongest of son-in-laws. When Rusko told Urza of the contest to win the hand of the princess, Urza said, That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Rusko persisted. It is the highest romance to vie for the hand of such a glorious treasure as she, worthy of a legendary story. Think of the tale of Titania and Delorean. Urza stared at Rusko incredulously. A Lorian gets ripped to shreds by Titania's hounds! Rusko tisked at him. A minor detail. A royal prize is worth the risk. Urza said nothing 
and walked off. The contest took place at the beginning of the month and Rusko had learned the only way to coax Urza to come to the event was to close the clockmaker shop and drag him forcibly. They arrived outside the Warlord's Palace where a throng of people were gathered. Most of the city was here to watch the spectacle. A line of hulking behemoths, more muscle than man, waited to take their turn. A massive gong rung out as a giant man gripped both sides of the statue and tried to lift it with no success. A second gong rung out, indicating the attempt was over. This process repeated itself with minor variations. Urza watched as some poor fellow obliterated his back trying to jerk lift the statue. Another unfortunate man managed to crush his fingertips under the statue. As he screamed in pain, Urza looked over at Rusko. Romantic. Rusko waved it away. They have a healers. He will be fine. Urza looked over the line of failed champions. This is a terrible way to choose a new leader. Whoever can carry a big rock? Insanity. Let's just go. Rusko nodded and led Urza on a path that took them by the royal pavilion. Rusko made a big show of bowing low with an ingratiating smile before Kayla and the warlord, while Urza gave a perfunctory nod of respect to the royals. Rusko leaned in as they walked away. The princess had her eye on you. She had a big smile on her face. Urza dismissed it. She smiled at everyone. I feel sorry for her having to marry one of those. He trailed off and stopped walking, staring off to the side of the pavilion. Rusko followed his gaze. Chests of treasure, dripping with gems and gold. Ancient relics and golden crowns. It truly was a king's ransom. But Rusko was surprised. You never really seem to be that interested in gold. I guess every man has his price, all right? Rusko surely does. As he said it, he slapped Urza good-naturedly on the shoulder. But he could see that Urza was fixated. Urza said one word. Thran. Rusko had never heard the word before, but he could hear genuine excitement in Urza's voice. Rusko, why is there a Thran tome on display here? Rusko smiled. Ancient tradition in crew is to provide a dowry. Whoever wins the hand of the princess also gains the treasure. Urza nodded. Are you familiar with someone named Jalem? The glyphs on the book mention that name. Rusko looked thoughtful. Many years ago, in the ancient days of Yosha, there was a Jalem. He was most likely an academic of some sort. Urza smiled as he looked between the pile of treasure and the princess. Master Rusko, I do believe it's time for me to move a statue. This statement produced a gale of laughter from Rusko. After he recovered, he said, My boy, may as well try to put the moon in your pocket. Urza turned to Rusko with determination in his eyes. This moon is not out of my reach. He sounded so confident that Rusko almost believed him. And that ends this installment of the Brothers War lore. I hope you enjoyed meeting Rusko. He's one of my favorite side characters in the story. If you enjoy what we're doing here, consider supporting us on Patreon. Go and watch some other lore. Enjoy yourself. I'll see you all for the next one. And remember, my friends, lore is life.